<laughs> Therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. While we don't have a budget date yet, we expect the budget to come sometime soon. The PC caucus is expecting to see some key planks in this budget, so I'll lay them out. The government's mismanagement of its finances has resulted in two credit downgrades and debt serving costs of over $11 billion annually. The province now spends more on interest than on post-secondary education, community safety and five other ministries combined. Mr. Speaker, because of this management, the government must take action. Will this budget begin the process of paying down debt and include a long-term plan to get Ontario's debt under control? Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker. And, uh, you know, I, th I think it's, it's important people understand that when the recession hit in 2008-09, we— The member from Leeds-Grenville knows better, and I expect better. Excuse me. Deputy Premier. Uh, Speaker, we made a very deliberate decision that we were not going to slash and burn. We were not going to fire thousands, hundred thousand workers. We were going to support the continued growth of this province. Speaker, we made a deliberate choice to invest in infrastructure, and we are seeing the consequences of that very deliberate decision. Some people advocated that we cut our way to balance. Our decision was Answer. to invest and grow our way to balance, and that's exactly what we've done. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Deputy Premier, and clearly no answer on getting Ontario's out-of-control debt. They seem to be satisfied with the fact we're the most indebted subnational government in the world. Now, another budget ask we have of the government is, and I'm sure the government appreciates, that millions of Ontarians are struggling with their hydro bills from unaffordable hydro rates. This government's Minister of Transportation hydro scheme does nothing but adds billions of dollars into debt, more into future costs on Ontarians back for hydro. The budget must take action. Rather than just borrowing, we'd actually like to see some structural changes. Mr. Speaker, will this budget include an announcement that the Liberals will stop signing bad contracts Minister of Housing. we do not need and stop the fire sale of hydro here, here, here. Thank you. Thank you for Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased to rise and talk about Ontario's fire hydro plan and, of course, Mr. Speaker, what we've done to take costs out of the system. Part of one of the first things that I did, Mr. Speaker, when I uh, became Minister of Energy. Okay, next time I stand, we're going to go to warnings. And you can have a perplexed look on your face all you want. Carry on, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the very first things that I was able to do as uh, Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker, is, is put a, a sp suspension on the LRP2, Mr. Speaker, um, which was something that saved uh, ratepayers billions of dollars. Again, Mr. Speaker, we brought forward the Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker, that is going to save ratepayers up to, uh, you know, an, uh, on average, 25 percent, which is something, Mr. Answer. Speaker, that all of them uh, right across the province, all families across the province are looking forward to, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Supplement, uh, final supplement. Mr. Speaker, again to the Deputy Premier, the question uh, was on stopping the signing of these bad contracts. Sure. There was no response. And no matter how many times the minister repeats himself, borrowing $25 billion to pay in interest is not a real plan if you don't deal with the structural issues. So since I can't get an answer on debt or hydro, I'll try a third budget ask, and that's on the housing affordability crisis that this government has created. They've decided to sit on their hands and collect the taxes and reap the benefits of an out-of-control housing market. Their careless decision to wait until the last moment has resulted in unprecedented inability for families in Toronto and the GTA and Ontario to afford homes. Mr. Speaker, this budget must take action. So my question to the Deputy Premier, and hopefully I can get an answer this time, is will this budget question. slash red tape to increase the housing supply in Ontario? Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of uh, Housing and Poverty. The Minister of Housing. 
Well, thank you, Speaker, and, uh, and thank you to the, uh, uh, the uh, Leader of the uh, Opposition for the question about uh, uh, housing affordability, which, is, which, of course, is on everyone's uh, tip of everyone's tongue these days. You know, I, we certainly understand the, the growing concern across the GTHA regarding the booming housing market, which, Speaker, I can say is feeling pressured in part because of the fantastic economy that this sure. province has created. There are, Speaker, about 100,000 people. There are 100,000 people flocking to the GTHA area every year because they're coming here for jobs and a wonderful quality of life. And that, uh, Speaker, has put pressure on the uh, the economy. And you know, later today we'll be meeting with uh, mayors from across the GTHA to understand and continue the dialogue with them about what tools they need to address housing affordability. Good question, the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is to Deputy Premier. And so the government, when it comes to debt, no plan. When it comes to hydro relief, no plan. And when it comes to housing, no plan. So. As promised, we're in warnings. Mr. Speaker, uh, to the Deputy Premier, clearly the government's uncomfortable in trying to answer their own record. Now, since we can't get an answer on debt, hydro, or housing, I'm going to ask another question that needs to be in this budget. The government's current cap and trade scheme is little more than a tax grab disguised in an effort to address climate change. A big cash grab, $1.9 billion. The current system is not only a cash grab, it's driving business out of Ontario. It is subsidizing business in California and Quebec at the expense of hardworking Ontario businesses. If this government is serious about protecting jobs in Ontario, Question. it will make sure that cap and trade is not a cash grab, that it's revenue neutral. Mr. Speaker, can we get a commitment from this government that in this budget it will, it will ensure there is no cash grab, Thank money you. will go back Back to Ontarians. Uh, to the Minister of, of uh, Environment and Climate Change. <coughs> Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is such an entertaining gentleman, I have to give him credit. Um, I, I'm trying to square this, Mr. Speaker. Maybe you could help me because you've been watching this for a long time. He wants to increase the price from $18 a ton to $74 a ton. That would jump gas prices by 16 cents. And I've raised this with him, and I think he's an honest gentleman, Mr. Speaker, and he's read David Sawyer's work on what a BC tax would look like. Could he please explain to us how he would justify in, the, in today's competitive economic environment how that makes any sense at all, Mr. Speaker? Thank you, supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question was on returning the funds to Ontarians from this $1.9 billion cash grab. Instead, I get numbers out of thin air, but I'm not surprised from a minister that actually wanted to ban natural gas in Ontario, a government that is so out of touch. So since I can't get an answer on that, I will try another tack, and that is on school closures. Maybe the government can do something in this budget if they're ignoring all the other issues. We have schools across Ontario. Can you relate it to the first question, please? Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question. Stop the clock. Unless I hear the preamble, uh, I'm listening to the preamble. I'm, I'm encouraging the member to make sure that it's related to the first question about climate change. Mr. Speaker, my first question was the budget ask, and my supplementary is a budget ask. Carry on. And I want a commitment from this government that we're going to stop seeing these school closures. I want to see a moratorium on the school closures we're seeing across this province. Too many towns, too many communities, too many parts of this province are having their communities ripped apart by these 600 potential school closures. And the government's question. saying it's not happening, but you can't go to a community in Ontario and, and not see a school that's being closed. So my question is this. Can I get a commitment, Mr. Speaker, from the government that they will put a moratorium on these reckless? Thank you. 
You see it, please? Minister. Minister of Education, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it's my pleasure to rise in the House today to, uh, to talk about what we're doing for schools in Ontario, because on this side of the House, we believe in publicly funded education. Since That's 2003, right. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we have built 810 new schools and we have extended 780 significantly by renovation. Mr. Speaker, we know that investing in our students is the best investments that we can make in this province, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we have increased the funding consistently for schools. Year after year. And you know, Mr. Speaker, in the members' own riding, we have built 11 new schools wow. since 2003. Wow. And Mr. I'm Speaker, sure it was there for the I, want, I want to remind this House that these investments the in education. Stop in, in, an, in an odd comment, I would like to hear the minister's answer, but I can't hear it from your own side. Investments we're making in education are leading to results, Mr. Speaker. 85.5 percent of our students are now graduating high school, Mr. Speaker, yeah. as opposed to only 68 percent in 2003. Thank you. Can you see any place? Do you see any place? Um, a reference to budget spending would, would be the best way to approach it. Final supplementary, please. Mr. Speaker, I want to continue with my budget ask of this government. And since I could not get an answer, a commitment from the government on school closures, let me try one more question to the Deputy Premier on the upcoming budget. The Minister of Finance face said it all when he saw the recent federal budget. It was disappointment, disdain, and dejection in terms of Ontario's request of the Government of Canada. Something did not go his way, did not go the way that the Minister of Finance had expected. Mr. Speaker, is the government still rewriting their budget because the federal Liberals let them down? Is it too late to consider these five PC requests to make sure Ontario gets on the right track? Thank you. President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Yes, thank you. And you know, when we faced the recession, we set out a very responsible approach to how we would deal with the budget. We're continuing to invest, including in 11 schools in your writing, to connect it to the last question. Chair, please. But uh, we also know that we needed to get to balance. We, uh, we committed that we would have a balanced budget in spring of 2017. We will have a balanced budget in spring 2017, 100 per cent certain. And we're able to do that because Ontario's economy has been growing because of our investment strategy, because of our job creation strategy. Ontario's economy is growing. Ontario's economy has been leading Canada. So we will have a balanced budget this spring. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. The cost of housing is reaching ridiculous heights in Toronto and in cities across Ontario. Last week, the Premier and her Liberal Party had a chance to help out renters facing unfair rent hikes by unscrupulous landlords, but she didn't take it. The Premier is meeting with GTHA mayors today to talk about housing affordability. Will she be telling those mayors that she will actually be closing the 1991 rent control loophole? Minister of Housing. Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, to the uh, member of the third party for that uh, that really important question. Uh, you know, I'll say again, Mr. Speaker, the Premier has said it many times. I've said it many times in this House that it is absolutely unacceptable that so many Ontarians are faced with with housing costs that are rising so dramatically. You know, and that's uh, that's why. We, uh, we are in the process of uh, developing that plan to address unfair rises in rental costs. You know, in the coming weeks, Speaker, we will be rolling out a very substantive rent control reform in Ontario. I've said
said it again. I'm happy to stand here and say it again uh, today, Speaker. You know, our plan is going to include a, a broad package of change that will help protect tenants. Mr. Speaker, one of the reasons that, that I could not support uh, the members— Answer. Uh, response to the member's uh, bill that was tabled uh, a couple of weeks ago was simply that it didn't do enough. We will do more. Thank you. Supplementary. So, Speaker, I take that as a no. I go on to my next question. While the Premier dithers on rent controls, 31 seniors in Sault Ste. Marie are facing a 31 percent increase in their rent. Wow. These seniors are living on a fixed income and a 31 percent rent increase on top of their soaring hydro bills may mean that a number of them will lose their homes. Terrible. Will the acting premier promise these seniors that rent control, any rent control or housing reform that is brought in will be retroactive so that they can hold on to their homes? Good question. Minister. Well, thank you again, Speaker, and it's always good to continue on with, uh, with the dialogue. You know, just uh, before, we, uh, before, before I carry on, you know, Speaker, I just want to highlight some of the few, just a few of the things that this government has done uh, to uh, to take action. You know, we've uh, we've worked on secondary suites with our municipal partners to make those easier. We've passed inclusionary zoning uh, legislation. We have frozen municipal property tax on apartment buildings. We've doubled doubled the maximum refund for first-time home buyers, and uh, we're continuing to collect data. You know, Speaker. Uh, this week, the leader of the third party told media when she was being interviewed, she was asked whether her party's rent control legislation doesn't do enough to protect renters, and she said, Speaker, absolutely not. And I agree with her on that, Speaker. It doesn't go far enough. That answer, that answer just isn't good enough. You know, Speaker, it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder yes, where, where this back of the napkin proposal by the NDP will leave the one million Ontarians who Thank already you. have rent control. Final supplementary. Well, dialogue is not a bad thing, but action is what's really needed here. Yeah. Action. Yeah. Some action. Ontarians aren't impressed by photo ops of the Premier with GTHA mayors. Renters need action, and they need it now. While the Premier sits on the sidelines, unscrupulous landlords in Toronto are taking advantage of this moment and, in some cases, doubling rents for people who can least afford it. Since the Premier refuses to close the 1991 rent loophole now, will she do it retroactively to protect people who are facing economic eviction because of unscrupulous landlords? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, and I will, uh, I will say that I, I didn't think that the NDP would oppose uh, the Premier meeting with our municipal leaders from across the GTHA, but it sounds to me as if they don't think that's a good idea, that we shouldn't be continuing the dialogue with our municipal partners, making sure, Speaker. It may indeed be the chair. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'll carry on. You know what? On this side of the House, we think it's really important to build those relationships with our municipal partners, with our federal partners. When it comes to important, the important issue of, of housing affordability, it's absolutely unfair. It's absolutely untenable that uh, uh, that uh, people face the uh, the issues they have with the rising rent. Um, you know, we uh, again, we are going to have you. solutions that take care. Of Fine. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. As you're well aware, photo ops are not a substitute for action. They are not. They are not. The Premier is out of touch with what the people of Ontario need. Gail, the question. single. Sorry, to the acting Premier. Thank, Thank you. you, Speaker. Gail, a single mom from Muskoka, wrote to the NDP to tell us she'd lost her home because her hydro bills were so high. She got behind. She just couldn't catch up. Does the acting premier think that someone like Gail should be punished for not being able to afford the soaring hydro bills that have come with 14 years of Liberal rule? Deputy Premier. Uh, to the Minister of Energy. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, once again, uh, 
uh, pleased to rise and talk about uh, our Fair Hydro Plan because it is concerning when we do hear about individuals in this province, Mr. Speaker, um, that did have a hard time and are having a hard time paying their electricity bill, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we acted, um, Mr. Speaker, like we did with the Fair Hydro Plan. We did bring forward, um, you know, the uh, the eight percent reduction and the changes to the Triple RP back in the fall economic statement. And we recognize, Mr. Speaker, that while that did help many, that there were others that actually um, needed more support. And that's what the Fair Hydro Plan will do, Mr. Speaker. It's going to provide 25 percent reduction uh, on average to families right across the province. Uh, if individuals are a Hydro One, R1, or an R2 customer, Mr. Speaker, they can see a 40 to 50 percent reduction. Yes, and if they're in uh, any of the uh, low income brackets, Mr. Speaker, there are many programs in place that will continue to help them. Thank you. And I hope that they actually apply for these. Yes. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. Gail's home in Muskoka was 1,600 square feet. She and her kids now live with her sister in Halton Hills in a bigger home. But Gail's sister's hydro bill, her sister's home, are lower than Gail's were because Gail had to pay rural delivery charges. When will the go Liberal government finally bring forward this plan they talk about, talk about, talk about? When will they finally bring it forward to deal with the mess in the hydro system, to deal with unfair rural hydro delivery rates? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I hope the honourable member listened to my last answer because I said we're actually bringing down um, distribution costs for six uh, utilities plus all Hydro One customers and R1 and R2 designations, Mr. Speaker. They're going to see a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. That's dramatic, Mr. Speaker. That is part of our Fair Hydro plan. It is something that we're acting on, unlike their plan, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't even talk about low-income individuals until the last page, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that we're acting, we're helping all families in this province with a special emphasis, Mr. Speaker. We are putting special emphasis on helping those families that are in the rural or northern parts of our province because we recognize that they were paying a higher share of the bill, especially, Mr. Speaker, when it came to distribution costs. That's why Answer. we're seeing reductions of 40 to 50 percent on their bills. Hopefully, Mr. Speaker, when that bill comes forward, they will vote for it. Final supplementary. Well, you can talk about a bill forever, but you're not introducing it and we aren't seeing the action. Gail wants to know from the Liberals, how will rural Ontario promote business development and population growth with hydro costs being difficult or impossible to afford? I'd like to know what the Premier's plan is, too, since her press releases and the publicly funded radio ads are pretty short on specifics. When will the Premier and when, 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 when will her party, the Premier, deal with the unfair delivery charges that Ontario rural families and businesses are dealing with just because they're outside of cities? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The summer, 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 summer is by the time we will actually have that in place, Mr. Speaker. But let's let's talk about you know being short on details, Mr. Speaker, and that's their pamphlet on dealing with electricity, Mr. Speaker. You know they rely on vague, vague principles and this determines yet to be determined expert panel that'll sit down and actually find some savings, Mr. Speaker. Apparently, you know, they're basing these on calculations that are pie in the sky, Mr. Speaker, with negotiations with the federal government. And I know, Mr. Speaker, I asked before how those negotiations are going. They're actually, Mr. Speaker, they have no idea on how to take off one cent from bills, Mr. Speaker. We are actually making sure we're taking off 25 percent. And when it comes to rural and northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, we're acting Answer. with a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. We take no lessons from that party. Thank you. Any question? Member from Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Mr. Speaker, many families of kids with autism spectrum disorder are back at Queen's Park today. They are disappointed and worried, upset that your government does not focus on their concerns and help Ontario residents with autism reach their full potential. Chrissy Levesque is here with her Lars, her seven-year-old son. And Lars finally started IBI therapy a year ago after this government kept him on a waiting list for four long years. Oh, wow. Chrissy feels caught between what the ministry tells her Lars deserves and what her regional office is willing to give. 
Mr. Speaker, has the minister drafted a proper standard of care for children with autism spectrum disorder with strict guidelines for regional providers? Good. Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, mother and uh, young man here to the legislature today and uh, thank the uh, member opposite for the, uh, the question. Uh, the member opposite knows that um, we put a plan in place last year, and we actually um, we cut the uh, the transition by half. So we're going to implement that plan um, to start in June of 2017, uh, a year earlier than we initially um, planned. And um, uh, Mr. Speaker. This plan is going to create 16,000 new spaces uh, across the province of Ontario, increase the amount of ABA uh, during the transition period, and ultimately reduce wait times to six months or less. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there has been a, a huge transition when it comes to uh, uh, young people Answer. with autism in the province of Ontario, and this government's committed to making sure we put in uh, place the right plan that works Thank you. for families. Supplementary. I would remind the minister, Mr. Speaker, that there are 21,000 children on the wait list already, and that keeps growing. Mr. Speaker, the minister has sent a letter to our families promising inclusion for all ages in autism therapy. In contrast, the minister's lead agencies are claiming that no children over five will qualify for the more intensive or enhanced ABA therapy in the new Ontario Autism Program. Mr. Speaker, the families don't want inclusion to mean just some kind of therapy for all ages. They want comparable therapy for all ages. Yeah. Will the minister please tell us if his mandate for inclusion in autism therapy will ensure that all children get the autism therapy that they need? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind the, uh, the member opposite of a few things. So, number one, uh, this is the largest investment in autism in the history of this country. Yes. Number one. Number two, we've increased our diagnostic hubs here in the province of Ontario. A couple of weeks ago, we made that announcement. We're creating 16,000 new spots. We've cut our IBI wait list by almost half uh, in the last uh, several months. And I want to remind the member opposite of something that I think is very important, because we're working on research. We're looking for ways to ensure that young people get the resources they need. And I'll remind the member opposite, when her leader was in Ottawa and had an opportunity to vote, when he had an opportunity to vote for a national plan for autism, he voted against it. Okay. Any question? The member from Thank you. My, my question is to the Acting Premier. This morning we learned that executives at the Canadian Hearing Society, which is funded by the Ontario government, received massive raises at the same time that their employees are walking the picket line because they haven't had a pay increase in four years. Yay. Terrible. That is shameful. But even worse is the fact that the organization's vice president was able to avoid having his massive pay raise out on the sunshine list because he chose to be paid as a consultant. Oh, Ooh, that's sneaky. Can the acting premier tell us how many more consultants are being paid high salaries with public money while keeping themselves off the sunshine list? Thank you. Deputy Premier. President Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, let me say that uh, the individual's uh, salary has been given to any many a member of the opposition, any member of the uh, media that has asked for it. Uh, with respect to the sunshine list, when you're dealing with tens of thousands of records, uh, there there is always every year there'll be a few that are missed. Uh, sometimes it's a clerical error. Sometimes when we track it down, we've got an agency that actually didn't submit the records on time to be included on the list. But what we always do in a circumstance like that, as we did in this circumstance, is we make the information available to anyone who asks, and then we publish an addendum which has all the information that was missed. And we will do that yes, again this year. It will be printed in the addendum. Thank you. Supplementary. One of the biggest issues is these people are giving themselves raises while the people who actually help deaf challenged people are out in the picket lines, unable to do their job. Transparency is vital to good government. We all know that. And Ontarians need to be able to trust things like the sunshine list. 
Can the acting premier clarify just how many executives are receiving salaries of more than $100,000 but didn't show up in the sunshine list this year or last year or the year before? Lots Please make that public. Yes, thank you. And as I just uh, as I just told you, uh, if you wanted to have the la answer for last year, you would go and look at last year's addendum. And I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me. But anybody in any year, as long as the Sunshine has ex list has existed, there has always been an addendum. Uh, many years it has been uh, not published to the fall. This year we're actually going to uh, publish a preliminary addendum in the spring. And then if there's still anybody that's missing, because as I said in the first answer, sometimes we find there's an agency that's just totally missing and we have to chase. Uh, but we'll get those uh, clerical errors out there in an early addendum this spring. And if there's anything we'll still miss, it will be in an ad addendum uh, in the answer. Your question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. This weekend, Ontario is going to celebrate its three-year anniversary of the phase-out of coal-fired wow. power plants. This move was the single largest greenhouse gas reduction initiative completed in North America. The elimination of coal plants has been a major factor in improving the quality of the air that we breathe. Thanks to clean air and clean energy, Ontario has saved more than $4 billion in annual health and environmental costs. Speaker, the 2016 Toronto Vital Signs report shows premature deaths and hospitalizations as a result of air pollution have dropped by 23 and 41 percent, respectively, since 2004. We have also seen the number of smog days drop from 53 in 2005 to zero in 2015. Speaker, could the minister please explain how the elimination of coal-fired plants puts Ontario in a competitive position? Question. Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Speaker. It's really nice. I, at least I know I'll get a supplemental on this one, Mr. Speaker. Um, the electricity we consume every day is already large carbon-free, thanks in part to the early action uh, uh, that was taken by uh, my friends at the Ministry of Energy, Mr. Speaker. To put that into terms, that's a drop from 35 million tonnes in 2005 to only 7 million tonnes in 2015, making it the largest greenhouse gas reduction ever in North American history, Mr. Speaker. And we, as Ontarians, should be very proud of that, Mr. Speaker. Um, and, and finally, the other thing is. Uh, our, our coal plants were larger, our largest source of methyl mercury and a number of other contaminants, Mr. Speaker. So the overall health of the environment and ecosystems and the restorative impact yes, of those closures continues to benefit Ontario today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his answer. The impact of Ontario's leadership on our environment and our health are remarkable. As the minister mentioned, eliminating coal as a source of generating electricity was a bold step. Such a large-scale shift away from pollution generation is unprecedented, and so Ontario had to carve its own path to build a cleaner generation. And Today, the province's electricity generation is 90 per cent emissions-free. Along the way, Ontario has built a strong industry in nuclear and renewable energy. Speaker, could the minister please give us an update on the state of electricity generation in the province since we eliminated coal? Question. Thank you, Minister of Energy, Speaker. I'd like to thank both uh, the minister for his previous answer and, of course, um, the member for uh, for that question. And I know, Mr. Speaker, we've recognized that the transition off of coal and the rebuilding of our electricity system uh, over the last decade, Mr. Speaker, put a strain on Ontarians' um, electricity costs. So. The Fair Hydro Plan is addressing this by providing 25% off, on average, um, from electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. But meanwhile, as the member noted, we can be proud that our commitment to eliminating dirty coal has created new industries in our province, Mr. Speaker. Renewable industries that we know the official opposition doesn't support, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the nuclear industry that supports tens of thousands of jobs in our province. Refurbishment of our nuclear plants will support 
even yes, more, sir. Mr. Speaker. And right now, I'm happy to report that OPG's refurbishment of Darlington is on both ahead of schedule and under budget, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Wow. New question, the member from Nipissing. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. The government's mismanagement has resulted in the debt climbing to over $308 billion. Wow. That leaves taxpayers on the hook for over $11 billion in interest each year. The Auditor General tells us this debt is crowding out the services people need. So we see this government closing schools and hospital beds, firing frontline health care workers and nurses. The Finance Minister says he will present a balanced budget. Sadly, this will only be an artificially balanced budget using the fire sale of assets and reserve funds. My question for the minister, does he really think the people of Ontario will be fooled into thinking the budget is actually balanced? Mr. Speaker, the member opposite made some uh, interesting points, and I want to reiterate them. We did choose to invest in the people of Ontario. We did choose to invest in infrastructure. We did choose to stimulate our economy and grow. And yes, we are balancing the budget this year, next year, and the year after that, Mr. Speaker. And when he talks, and when he talks about debt, he misses the point completely. We have an accumulated deficit to GDP the same today as it was 25 years ago. His leader made and agreed and voted for the largest deficit in Canada's history of $55 billion, Mr. Speaker. They raised debt and doubled it in the national uh, well, by $144 billion in accumulated deficits. That's what he put forward for Canada. Our debt to GDP is is falling, it's improving, and we are coming in balancing. We're working for the people of Ontario. Well, back to the minister. Speaker, I think he missed some of the points that I made, so let me expand on them. In my hometown of North Bay, you fired 350 frontline health care workers, including 100 nurses. 30 to 40 more will be fired this month. You closed 60 beds at our brand new hospital. So, Speaker, it's because of their constant waste mismanagement and scandal that has I don't need a, an armchair quarterback at this moment but I also ask the members while the question's being put I'm ready to get on them and then I hear heckling on that side it's the same thing you've done both sides so let's just relax and by the way we're on warnings please finish Speaker, their constant waste, mismanagement and scandals has resulted in people of Ontario paying more and getting less. So whether you're a family or a business, life in Ontario has increasingly become unaffordable. Businesses continue to flee the province, unable to keep up with Question. the hydro rates, the cap-and-trade rate uh, 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 grab, and the red tape. Speaker, does the minister truly believe an artificially balanced budget is going to help anyone? Thank you. Sure. You know, they know a lot about artificial uh, balances, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think they only balanced all the time that Harris government was in power four times. The last one was bogus, Mr. Speaker. It wasn't even balanced. Furthermore, he makes reference to the cost of debt. During their time, it cost 15.4 cents for every revenue dollar raised to cover their debt. Today, it's 8.4 cents because we're locking in low interest rates, Mr. Speaker. And we're investing. He and his party wanted to make across the board cuts as a solution to, to battling the deficit. We chose otherwise. We chose to invest in the things that matter to people. We chose not to put anybody in harm's way. We chose to grow the economy. It's working. We're balancing this year. We're balancing next year and the year after that, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener-Waterloo. 
very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Today we are marking the 100th anniversary of some women getting the right to vote here in Ontario. A century ago, women formally entered public life in this province. But yesterday, the women of Ontario were reminded in a report that the gender wage gap is still 30 per cent and has barely changed in 30 years. We have been waiting. We are still waiting but we aren't going to wait anymore. Ontario needs to ensure that women are equal partners in our economy. That means, that means access to affordable, high-quality, not-for-profit childcare. Does the Acting Premier and this government get that? Thank you. Deputy Premier. To the uh, uh, Minister of Status of Women. Minister of Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, yes, absolutely, we know there's a gender wage gap committee, uh, the gender wage gap, because after all, we looked at the recommendations that came out from the steering committee. The number one and number two recommendations were about an investment in childcare. Our premier made sure that there was a minister responsible for early years in childcare. We committed to doubling the number of spaces that are out there. We're we're getting, looking forward to transforming the way we're delivering childcare in this province. In addition, we're increasing the number of women on boards. We're making sure that the Good first work. jurisdiction to introduce comply or explain rules. We've got a government target of 40 per cent for women on provincial agencies, and we have Answer. a business target of 30 per cent. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're already moving on so many Thank things. You. I'm so glad yeah, that they, they are finally getting it. Thank you very much. Speaker, we know what needs to be done to empower women in Ontario. Right now, this province does not have a child care strategy. We do not have a child care system, and we have been waiting for 14 years. The first recommendation from our own Ministry of Labour's report from the Gender Wage Gap Strategy Committee reads that government should immediately commit to developing an early child care system which is high quality, affordable, accessible, publicly funded and geared to income with sufficient spaces to meet the needs of Ontario families. We know that every dollar invested in child care leads to $2.40 in benefit to the Ontario economy due to the increase in working hours and wages of women. When will this government make sure that women in Ontario can fully participate in the economy by developing a comprehensive child care strategy. You have not shown it. You have a credibility issue on this issue. Question. Show us the plan. You know, Speaker, I am so pleased to answer this question because actually I think it's kind of a friendly question. Bottom line, first of all, when it comes to affordable, quality, responsive, and accessible child. Minister. All of those pieces were actually included in our workbook. So just so you know, I went out on consultations across the province, spoke to people, th thousands of people actually, both online and directly, went to more than 20 cities and centres in our province, and we took that workbook with us. And the member opposite was actually at some of those consultations. So she's very aware that when it comes to affordable, quality, responsive, accessible childcare, we put those ideas on the table. Answer. And now she's telling me that those are her ideas and we should be acting on them. We New question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Minister, as you know, today we recognize the International Day of Pink, a day where we recognize the anti-bullying initiative that began in Nova Scotia after a grade 9 student was bullied in his school for wearing pink. 
Two students who witnessed the incident bought pink shirts to stand united with the student against bullying. Students, educators, and people throughout my riding of Kingston and the Islands are uniting today to celebrate diversity. I know that Youth to Kingston or Y2K, the Boys and Girls Club of Kingston, Girls Inc., etc., have worked diligently to educate and create positive attitudes in anti-bullying spaces. It's important that we continue to stand together and create awareness not only today but every single day. Yeah. Speaker, can the minister tell this House how we ensure our students feel safe and respected at schools across our province? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for this wonderful question. It's so great to see this movement, which started with students, that is having such an impact in a conversation around uh, bullying in, in schools and, frankly, in the community, Mr. Speaker. Our schools must be places where everyone, where staff, students, parents and the community feel welcome, feel safe and respected and accepted. And that's why I'm proud of our Accepting Schools Act. The Act Act is Canada's most comprehensive anti-bullying legislation, and as part of its definition of bullying, it also includes cyberbullying. School safety has been a priority for this government from the beginning, and that's why we require all school boards to have policies on bullying prevention and intervention. Mr. Speaker, Answer. this government has invested over $425 million in safe schools initiatives and are helping make Ontario schools some of the safest in the world. Thank you, Minister. We are extremely proud of the investments made towards educating not only our students but parents and staff. I know that this will have an impact on the young women that are here with us today in the Speaker's Gallery, and I am sure they will appreciate the leadership that we have taken. For the first time ever, we have defined bullying in legislation so that every single student, teacher, and principal and parent knows what we're talking about when we say bullying is not okay in our schools. Minister, in 2015, you introduced the revised health and physical education curriculum to better reflect the advancement of technology, making information readily available to students. Can you please tell us about the benefits of the revised curriculum and how it is helping our students navigate in today's technology-driven world. Question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I really want to thank the member for this, this supplementary question because the reality is that we want our children to be safe and healthy while ensuring that they have access to accurate information. We've updated our health and physical education curriculum so that students understand the importance of healthy relationships, having the confidence to say no, safe use of technology and the internet and mental health safety, Mr. Speaker. This curriculum now offers increased support and acceptance and visibility to LGBTQ and two-spirited children and youth. We will continue to support our school boards as they work closely with parents to ensure that every student feels safe as, at school. We will continue to work with community partners to develop awareness campaigns for schools that provide skills for youth and educators to be effective and engage role yes, models sir. and allies of our schools across Ontario. Every student has the right to feel safe and accepted at school, Thank you. and if students don't feel safe, they can't learn, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question? The member from here on Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment. For two years, the Black and Stakuras in Huron-Bruce has suffered night and day from incessant noise associated with industrial wind turbines built around their homes. Just last week, to their relief, Ministry of Environment and Climate Change testing proved that there were audible sounds and possibly tonal noises coming from the wind turbines that exceeded allowable sound level limits according to Regulation 09. Finally, after years of feeling ignored by this government and helpless to defend themselves because of their rights being stripped away, they believed a resolution was finally here. But you know what they were told, Speaker? More testing needs to be done. Oh. So I asked the minister, why should these families have to continue to suffer while waiting for more testing? Question. Or is it that you need more time to devise a plan that ignores your own ministry's yeah. research? Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. <sighs> Mr. Speaker, an environment question from the party opposite, finally. Thank you. The challenge here, Mr. Speaker, is that the law works. 
There are standards. When people call, I'm very proud of the officials. They respond quickly and they enforce the law. The law is being enforced here. If, the, if wind turbines or any other type of technology exceeds sound levels, we enforce the law. I am happy to meet with the member opposite to review this case to make sure that the ministry is being diligent. No one should have to suffer noise uh, or noise pollution from any source, and certainly not wind turbines in their community, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. I look forward to that discussion because, Speaker, once and for all, it's time for this government to finally address noise concerns associated with industrial wind turbines. They can no longer ignore these hulking monoliths that serve as reminders of this Liberal government's failed policies. The Minister of Environment needs to accept the good work from his own staff and the concrete data that shows noise levels are above acceptable sound limits. I look forward to this discussion. And action needs to happen today. Instead of protecting Liberal friends, will this minister take immediate action to protect the well-being of Ontario residents, immediately stop the turbines in question, acknowledge the test results from his own staff, and once and for all, do right by the citizens of Ontario affected by Question. industrial wind turbines. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are going to enforce the law to the full extent. We are not going to treat one group of proponents of a project or one community any lesser, Mr. Speaker. There is a law. It is being enforced. If the member actually doesn't think it's being enforced, then she should raise that issue with me, and I will review it with the deputy. But, Mr. Speaker, it's passing strange to me that I never get a question when they were in power about mercury and grassy narrows. I never get a question about, about nuclear power. I never, get a, I never get a question about coal plant pollution. The, the, this party is just an anti New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Today we are joined by families and children living with autism. They will be rallying once again outside the legislature at noon. They're here, Speaker, because they have been let down so many times before by this government, and unfortunately, they see the writing on the wall for more of the same. Despite the minister's promises, newly diagnosed children, five and over, are still unable to access intensive treatment. The families of children who have been approved for treatment can access the funds when they need them. Will the minister tell families today the children, five and over, will receive the same intensive treatment that they need? Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member for the question. Um, I've had this file for almost a year now, and um, the one thing I can say is that when I meet with parents uh, from across the province of Ontario, you know, I'm constantly reminded of the challenges that they have as families because some of the challenges that um, that they go through um, are just so overwhelming for parents, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we have a premier that is committed to making sure that uh, we get this uh, right. Um, this is an issue that has, uh, it just hasn't popped up uh, overnight. This is an issue that has an historical context here in the province of Ontario. Uh, the Premier, uh, people like myself and many members on this side of the House have been working on this issue at school boards, uh, in our local communities, um, and, uh, and personally. So I, um, I want the member to know opposite that, and, 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 and I do believe that parents understand this, that there is a commitment by this government to make sure we get this right, uh, because we cannot Thank afford you. to get it wrong. Sir, just yesterday, I heard again from a mother of twins with autism who is in a constant struggle to get funding she is entitled to and to be assured that the funding will continue. Because of her uncertainty, she has had to register them for school, even though, that she, even though she knows that without intensive treatment, they will regress. 
Pro progress made in self-feeding and potty training will be lost. Behaviors like headbanging and eating anything in their grasp will return. Right now, she uh, will be out of pocket for more than $2,500 just for the month of May, money she does not have because the ministry, for some reason, can't get it together and get their approved money flowing. Will the minister ensure that approved funding is available when it's needed and that families get the information they need now? Thank you, minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, the member opposite does know that uh, money is flowing uh, from the government to support families with children uh, with autism. In fact, currently, there, uh, during the transition period, we put in the $10,000 allocation uh, that can be uh, reused, so an allocation of $10,000. Um, Mr. Speaker, almost 2,400 families currently are using that service, and some families over the last several months um, are at the seventh installment of this funding. So we're talking about a $70,000, $80,000 investment into their children over seven months. Um, we are committed to making sure that we get this right. We are committed, we are committed to making sure that young people in this province of Ontario um, uh, get the resources they need so they can reach their full potential. Yes, There's too much at stake, and this is a government that is committed to making sure that young children here in the province of Ontario are set up for success. New question, the member from the Provincial Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. The minister and I and many members of the legislature started out at the municipal level of politics, and we all know the critical role that those municipalities, local governments, play in Ontarians' daily lives. They provide many frontline services, and they also provide the critical local infrastructure, like the roads we drive on, the parks we play in, and the pipes and treatment facilities that keep our water clean. I'm proud our government is making the largest infrastructure investment in schools, roads, hospital, public transit and bridges in the province's history. And we're investing in the people and communities that make Ontario strong. Our government is also providing predictable, ongoing support to municipalities Question. through a number of programs. Would the minister elaborate what those programs are and how they benefit municipalities across Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, thank you very much. I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question. Speaker, as the Minister of Municipal Affairs, uh, take great pride in the relationship that we've established with the municipal sector over the years since coming into government in 2003, specifically uh, through the AMO MOU Roundtable. Speaker, through that venue and through programs in this government, we have increased significantly the financial assistance that flows to the municipal sector in Ontario. When we came to government in 2003, Speaker, that was somewhere in the neighbourhood of $1 billion. Today, Speaker, the financial package that flows annually in support of our municipal sector in the province of Ontario is somewhere in the range of $4 billion. Wow. An increase, Speaker, of $3 billion, a four-fold increase. Speaker, I would say that if you are a municipal property taxpayer in the province of Ontario, our government has provided significant Answer. capacity and room for your municipal councillors to manage their budgets and provide their services to those constituents in a very affordable way. Thank you, Minister. And I understand that these programs work together to benefit municipalities across Ontario. For example, the OMPF is now largely a northern and rural grant, providing over 90 per cent of its funding to northern and rural municipalities. Provincial transit funding to municipalities through the gas tax program benefits the nearly 100 municipalities in the province with public transit systems, and OSEF provides annual funding to small northern and rural municipalities. But there's been a focus on funding for the City of Toronto in recent weeks, and I understand programs like provincial uploads and gas tax provide significant ongoing support to the city in addition to pro provincial funding for specific projects. Would the minister elaborate on some of the support the province has provided to the City of Toronto since we've come to office? Question. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, well, the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore asks a great question. Speaker, we recognize that the City of Toronto represents 
represents the fifth or sixth largest economy in Canada, and as such, we recognize that it merits serious and specific attention. In that vein, Speaker, we have uploaded $530 million from the City of Toronto, uh, as well as providing $170 million annually in gas tax funding, totaling about $1.9 billion new revenues for the City of Toronto so far. And as people will know, they've heard the Minister of Transportation announce that we will be doubling that gas tax funding so that on an annual basis, the City of Toronto will be receiving $340 million starting very soon. Speaker, in addition, examples of major infrastructure projects, $5.3 billion for the Eglinton Crosstown, $1.48 billion to extend the Bloor Danforth Danforth subway line in Scarborough, uh, Speaker, and actually even in the members' riding from Etobicoke Lakeshore, very recently the Minister announced $50 million for the Kipling Mobility Hub and the Tropical Lakeshore. Speaker, these are just some of the examples of the amazing support we have provided financially to the Thank City you. of Toronto. New question, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Back in December of 2016, the Minister received a proposal from the Ontario Personal Support Workers Association requesting the right to become the provincial governing body of personal support workers. In their request, they highlighted the greater need and increased role of our hardworking PSWs. Due to the increased need for home and community care, there are many more PSW in today's health care system. Never too late to get a warning. As I said, there are many, many more PSWs in today's health care system than in years past. As such, it has become apparent that there is a great need for oversight, which includes a governing body that oversees the needs of PSWs and their responsibilities, and more importantly, the needs of their clients. Speaker, the minister has stated that he is supportive of a health care system that protects all patients and health care providers. Question. Therefore, can he tell us when we can expect a response or action regarding this proposal? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. And The member opposite is correct that uh, the ministry has received a proposal from the association uh, representing our PSWs. And, and I think I speak for everyone, Mr. Speaker, in this legislature that we have such great respect for the thousands upon thousands of PSWs that are working in every facet of our health care system. They are often our unsung sung heroes, Mr. Speaker, doing incredibly important work to the highest quality, and I want to express my appreciation for that. And part of that, Mr. Speaker, Part of that appreciation has been reflected in the fact that we have increased the minimum wage for our PSWs in this province by $4 an hour. So the minimum threshold for that minimum wage now is at, stands at $16.50, Mr. Speaker. We are, are so invested in elevating this profession to where it should be, to be recognized for the important Thank work you. that they do. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. The question wasn't about wages. The minister is well aware that the time to make decisions regarding health care is now. The system can't wait any longer. With an aging population and our health care services being rationed, it is imperative that his government take action. The OPSWA's proposal is, comp is comprehensive and outlines the importance of safety, accountability, legitimacy, trust, and oversight, things the government claims to uphold. Speaker, the minister has acknowledged the important and expanding roles of our PSWs in our health care system. How much longer will all PSWs have to wait for the validation, the validation they deserve? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we as a government are validating our PSWs. We've created a $10 million annual fund for PSW training so that they can enhance their training, Mr. Speaker. We've created a common curriculum and educational standard for our PSWs. We, uh, Mr. Speaker, last year alone, we added $80 million to home and community care where many of our PSWs work, resulting in an additional $1.3 million hours of PSWs 
PSW work in our homes and communities, Mr. Speaker. We've added 2,500 PSWs in our long-term care homes since 2008. We're looking at this proposal, that aspect of regulation and oversight, and really to give the respect and the elevation to the pre profession that it deserves is one important element of our stabilization strategy. We're looking at their proposal as we're looking at other options, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member from Scarborough Rouge River on a point of order. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the earlier we had the most important visitors uh, in your gallery, speaker's gallery, and uh, I, I uh, missed the opportunity in to introduce the three delegates from the uh, best community city of Toronto, Scarborough. And their name is Christina Behari and Rachel Hyman and Kali Sajian. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Minister, Speaker, if I could, I've just noticed in the members' east lobby from Thunder Bay representing Paro Enterprise, uh, Ms. Roslyn Lockyer. Thank you. There being, there being no further, there, there being no deferred vote, this House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.